Doctor continued to reach the finals of the British Amateur year after year. This is despite the heavy burden of his GP practice reducing his general playing opportunities. In 1934, a young American player from Stanford University, William Lawson Little, swept all before him in the championship, held at Prestwick. He was highly regarded as a future champion, powerfully built. He drove the ball massive distances and had no weaknesses in his game. It's worth saying that while he didn't achieve these great expectations, he did in 1940 win the US Open. So by any measure, he was a great player. At Prestwick that year in the 36-hole final, he won 14-13 and 13 against a popular local man, James Wallace. That score remains a record-winning margin in a final, and all reports record Wallace played well. Bernard Darwin, the great golf writer of the day, described Little in these terms. I feel that the brush should be dipped in earthquake and eclipse to do justice to Lawson Little. For here was a player for whom my too hard-worked epithet, formidable, is scarcely strong enough. Little was intimidating. Little won the US Amateur in 1934 and in 1935 decided to remain as an amateur and try and achieve that tremendous feat again and put himself into the history books. If anything, he was now an even stronger player than the year before. In 1935, the championship was held for the first time at Royal Lytham and St Anne's. The course at that time was not on the open rota. Awarding the British Amateur to the club was recognition of both the quality of the links and the potential to become a major venue. 1935 was the 50 year anniversary of the amateur championship. Little had a wobble in the first round. He shot a poor score, but still managed to win on the 18th green. There were six former champions playing that year, but by the time of the quarter-finals, only the doctor had won through. A great achievement when looking at how little golf he was then playing. The doctor was in the top half of the draw, little in the bottom half, and not playing his best golf yet. It was almost like he was playing in second gear. The real interest for the golfing public was in that top half and how far the doctor now pushing 40 years old, could go. Both quarter-finals in this top half went to the last green, with the doctor and Tony Torrance, a Scot, winning the day and setting up a much-anticipated semi-final. Torrance ran out of steam in the semi-final and was beaten in a close match by the doctor finishing on the 17th green. Sports fans often hold differing opinions on what they witness or read about. In 1927, the doctor won his major title in a closely contested but not unexpected result. However, the final over 36 holes in 1935 was not expected to be closely contested. In many ways, now the fans' view of 1935 was that this was the Doctor's finest hour. Let us consider the two finalists. The Doctor was past his prime. He had played little golf in that year, was overworked in his practice, and more or less made to take a break by his own Doctor. His son Michael remembers how his father was often called out in the middle of the night to an emergency, and then the following day did a full shift in his GP practice. Happily, his enforced break coincided with the week of the championship, but his participation was far from certain, and it was the doctor's wife Dorothy who urged him on that year, feeling the distraction of competitive golf would give him a complete break from his day-to-day -day burdens. He entered the competition through the secretary at Starbridge Golf Club and apparently only made the deadline for that year's entries by 20 minutes. His opponent, Lawson Little, 25 years old, not troubled by the demands of an intense and difficult medical profession, powerfully built, very fit, coached to a top level, surrounded by his team, able to outdrive the doctor by up to 80 yards. Little was rightly one of the biggest favourites in many a year. This was to be a procession for the young American, to another thumping final win and the amateur double again before turning professional. Indeed, Little moved to three up very quickly and the script appeared to be falling into place. However, the doctor wasn't phased. He had faced much bigger trials on a different field many years before this encounter. He knew how to keep both his concentration and the steady rhythm of his reliable swing. He won the 18th with a three getting to lunch at three down. Little headed back to his hotel for lunch. The doctor remained in the clubhouse and kept his focus on the job in hand. Little returned to the course late after going back to his hotel. Indeed, he was 20 minutes late on the tee and very fortunate not to be disqualified. 
He explained to the match referee that he'd taken a bath and not realised the time. The first seven holes were halved, then on the eighth the doctor holed a good putt for a birdie and a win. Two down. Nine and ten were halved, but at the eleventh the doctor got up and down from the rough to win another hole. The vast crowd following the match, estimated at over 10,000, were now sensing that they were witnessing something very special. They were roaring the doctor on at every opportunity and he was not disappointing them. At 12, the doctor hit a glorious tee shot onto the green while Little wilted and put his tee shot into the rough, followed by a poor chip. The doctor putted the ball dead to the hole and his three was conceded and the match was now all square. The doctor missed a nine foot putt on 13, just stopping short of the hole. The match remained all square. The same happened on the 14th with the doctor just missing a five foot putt but this time he went one down again. The momentum had definitely shifted through these two missed putts. On 15 and 16 there were bunker problems for both players. On 15 the doctor failed to get up and down from the front bunker and lost the hole to a par four to go two down. On 16 Little played a great shot from the greenside bunker and somehow managed to squeeze the putt in for a half when the doctor's fine play looked certain to give him a win at that hole. At the 17th, it looked like it would be the end of the match. The doctor was in a bunker on the right of the green, but to the great joy of the crowd, the doctor's courage came to the fore again. He clipped the ball off the sand with an iron. The ball rolled over the hole to four feet away. Little, who had his own problems on that hole, was 12 feet away in the same three shots. Little missed his putt and the doctor holed out to bring the match back to one in Little's favour. The atmosphere was now electric. In the clubhouse, every viewing place was taken. The crowd were ten deep along the fairway and around the green. They both hit good drives. The doctor's second left him ten yards short of the hole, while Little was just a bit further away but past the hole. Little putted up first and left the ball a couple of inches from the hole for a par four. The doctor had one last chance to square the match and take it further. He struck the putt firmly, but as it got close to the hole, it moved off line and finished just inches right of the hole. Little was champion again and a fine player, but all who were there when recalling this great sporting occasion would remember with more fondness the great fighting display of the hero of the day, the doctor. Let the last word on the 1935 championship final be from the same Bernard Darwin who wrote in such glowing terms in 1934 about Lawson Little. He had this to say about the doctor. Never have I admired a golfer more than I did Tweddle in that disastrous beginning of the match. His serenity and cheerfulness, the care that he took, and it is so much easier to take care when you are up. His whole demeanour was beyond praise. The doctor continued to play in the British Amateur, making his final appearance in 1955 at the age of 58. Still a great tournament then, but not with the status it had back in 1927 when he was the champion. Throughout these later years, he continued to be competitive. In the 1946 finals, he reached the last eight, the quarter-final. He was now nearly 50 years old. He came up against the great James Bruin, a fine Irish player from Cork, who was half his age. The Yorkshire Post reported the match in some detail, starting with the words, Play magnificent fighting golf, Dr Tweddle of Stourbridge, 49-year-old former champion, took James Bruin to the 18th green before losing the seventh round match. Bruin went on to become champion that year. Throughout the doctor's participation in these championships over a 29-year period, excluding World War II years, and despite his record, he was an underrated player. It was partly his style and partly his age in the latter years. One story from the 1950s had two young Americans on the first day scanning the practice putting green, eyeing up the competition. Their eyes fell upon the doctor in his plus fours, looking like he had come from a past world. The one said to his friend, I hope I get him in the early rounds, as if it would be a bye. He got his wish and was duly beaten five and four. Again, let us let the great golf writer Bernard Darwin have the final word. He wrote about a competitor commenting on the doctor during the 1928 championship at Prestwick. On one of the practice days, he was waiting for the group in front to tee off on the first tee. Observing the doctor's opening tee shot, he remarked, well, thank goodness, there is one player in this tournament I can beat. Imagine how disconcerted he was on hearing that he'd been watching the reigning champion. 
Darwin then goes on to say, nobody would have been more amused than Tweddle himself. The doctor had one last great golfing honour coming his way in 1961, when he was made captain of the RNA. A great and well-deserved honour for this great sportsman. The doctor had three children, William, who was also a doctor and GP, Mary Ann and Michael. He has a grandson, Matthew Tweddle, son of Michael, and a great-grandson, Ben Robinson, whose mother is Fiona, daughter of the son William, and whose father is Jeremy Robinson. Michael has many memories of his father. As with a lot of World War I soldiers, he didn't talk about his wartime experiences, but Michael once asked him about his wound, and his father told him that one of his men shouted to him, Look out, sir! And if he had not moved at that exact moment, the bullet that entered his side and back would have gone through his heart. He also felt that the soldier's cry had saved his life. Michael also remembered Bernard Darwin visiting the family. Michael was anticipating a fairly dull evening. It turned out to be the best evening ever, as the whole family got an insight into the mind of this exceptional journalist and writer holding forth that night on his cricketing stories. Michael said that his father retired from golf in the mid-70s, troubled by his hip problem. However, before he stopped playing at Stourbridge, he shot under his age on more than one occasion. In concluding, how can we sum up the Doctor's life? Full-length feature films have been made about people who have achieved far less. He was a true sportsman in the old Corinthian casuals mode. He was honourable in all he did and achieved, brave under duress, selfless in life, skilful in work and play, humble in victory and defeat, cheerful in good and bad times. In short, he embodies all that we want of a true champion. Please feel free to like this video or subscribe to our YouTube channel Black Star Golf to receive further features or tips throughout 2022.